you are listening to season 2 of the humans of ai stories not stats podcast where devi parik and dhruv patra talk to ai researchers to try and understand who they are as people what their life is like what they think about what they're insecure about what they get excited about questions that reveal the stories of their day to day lives in this episode dhruv talks with aaron corbel who is a professor at the university of montreal and a member of the Mila Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute. Aaron talks about his determination when chasing ideas, finding serenity in fishing, his fascination with game theory, how he treasures family time and a lot more. For more information on the podcast and episodes, check out the Humans of AI website linked in the description and with that, let's jump right to the episode. And hey, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you doing? Good. Good. I'm uh, I I'm apprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, don't be. You you I I imagine you've seen some of these. I I actually have not. I've uh, okay. I've heard about some of these, but uh yeah, so I I'm, I'm going in kind of cold, but uh it's all right. I it's yeah. So then, yeah, that's uh, even that's even better. Then you have nothing to be apprehensive yeah. about, or at least nothing concrete, <laughs> nothing concrete to be apprehensive about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how are things with you? Good, good. Um, the w- last weekend is when uh, both Davy and I we got done with our vaccination, the second shot. Oh wow! You're done. Yeah, we're, we're like done. completely like both both yeah. rounds. If oh wow. I'm jealous. We yeah, we're we're pretty far away from that here actually. I guess I guess universe I guess you get it because you're a university professor, is that right? Yeah, that's right. There's a there's an education mandate. Uh, there's a federal education mandate to prioritize uh, educators. Uh, but pretty soon like uh, so Georgia has already opened uh, uh, eligibility to everyone in the state and California I think is opening it soon in April at some point will be everyone in the state. Wow. Hey Georgia, the I've been hearing about you your state. Uh politics has been interesting there I guess lately. Yeah, it's been in the news and <laughs> not always yeah. for great reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. I guess that's kind of how it goes, but uh yeah, anyway, be fun yeah. to talk about that sometime. <laughs> okay. Uh but, Let's let's get started. So, uh, sure. Aaron Kuvo, welcome to Humans of AI. Thank you for agreeing to participate. Um, as you know, this is this is being recorded. I have a sequence of questions for you. Some are uh, light and may not require much thought. Uh, others may require a bit more considerations. In which case, feel free to pause and take your time to think. Um, we can sure. skip questions if you want to, uh, but when in doubt, if you can err on the side of being. open transparent vulnerable we appreciate it the no good okay Sounds great. so what were you doing right before this call i was in a meeting actually uh, i was in a meeting with some students and uh, some people from microsoft research discussing what we do next with the project hmm. not very excited <laughs> but uh, sounds sounds uh, sounds typical sounds i'm not surprised <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could I could imagine. <laughs> yeah. What's your what's your daily routine like? What's my sorry, my daily routine? Mm-hmm. Oh, so I guess I wake up quite early, um usually about 4 a.m. and then I um uh, still bit of work. I I like to work in the morning um and uh then then i make actually i make a coffee first then i work and then I, at some point i start making porridge for for my twins cuz they they like that and then yeah then i sometimes go jogging not quite as often as i'd like but uh but sometimes go jogging in the morning and then shower meetings and yeah that's and then meetings 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 uh get a certain amount of time in there to do a little bit of of other kinds of work and then evening comes we make dinner and yeah so it's 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 in covid it's been uh interesting cuz it's all been at home so i kind of miss my my normal walk to to work but 
I have to say, I kind of like it. I, I've gotten used to living here at home and working here. So I don't know. I, I'm one of those people that are maybe not that looking forward to the end of this. <laughs> I, I, I know such people. I know I know, yeah. I know such people who are, who are not looking forward to the end of this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like we're talking about this. Uh, Joelle and I were talking about this. That I'm, I'm. It's kind of my personality is very much made for this. I'm not, I'm not really that very much of a social person. I don't really miss kind of going out to big events and things like that. My, what I consider fun are, are more like sort of solitary activities and stuff like that. So it really hasn't, you know hindered my enjoyment of life that much, actually. It's just kind of giving me more opportunities, in fact, for the kinds of things I like to do. So, <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, if you're up at four, do you also crash already? <laughs> yeah, 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 I do. I, I'm often in bed at around like, yeah, nine, nine thirty. It depends. In the summertime, it gets harder to go to sleep when, when it's still light out. So I tend to shift a little bit later. But yeah, I, I, I pretty early and then pretty early to bed too. Um, yeah, it's, it's it, I think it evolved. I'm just naturally a morning person, but I think it also evolved from like, like just procrastinating as much as possible. And so I would like do things the morning before they're due in, in university. And so, yeah, that, that was, um, it's kind of where it probably came from. Yeah. What's the, what's the favorite part of your day? morning <laughs> yeah the, it's i it's great to me I, you know i get up and i'm the only one up and it's still often dark out and i just it's quiet i love that time yeah and what's the least favorite part of your day uh least favorite part of my day good question um i guess it depends sometimes if i actually have something to do at night like if i have to work at night that becomes my least favorite part of the day because i'm tired and i have to i'm working and so i get a little grumpy um yeah i guess that's that would be probably it um the the yeah i guess I, the other I, the other least favorite part of my day sometimes is in the in, if I've got like a day full of meetings and like and towards the end of that like let's say around three to five that that tends to get a little bit long so that that part is tough mm -hmm. yeah so yeah <laughs> Do you said, oh uh, I mean I, <laughs> I uh, my, my favorite part of the day is generally uh, when I'm in the when I'm working out when I'm in the gym uh, it's a it's, oh, a, yeah. nice, oh, it's a very cool. serene part of the day because it you know you you don't think about much else and it uh, it sort of just takes over. There's there's a there's a certain uh, clarity that pain provides that it. it, <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, yeah, I could see that actually. Yeah, I, I yeah we do I do do some jogging in the mornings now, but. Um, I generally jog with a friend of mine and we just chat about all kinds of things so that I don't have that kind of serenity. Whereas I used to, when I used to jog to work, I would have that cause I'd be on my own. And, and I like that kind of, uh, those kinds of quiet moments. It's yeah. But that's why, that's why the, the morning is when I get that, that kind of the, the quietness, but yeah. Do you set an alarm in the morning? Uh, I used to. Um, no, I don't. Well, the, yeah, I, I don't typically. Sometimes I do, but quite frankly, Joel gets a little uh, upset when their alarm goes off at four in the morning, as you can imagine. So I, I try not to use one that often. So yeah, yeah. And, so I, I usually end up waking up on my own. And over time, you've trained your body that you're able to just get up at four without any alarm. Yeah, yeah. Actually, for some reason, I don't know if this is common or not, but ever since COVID has set in, I'm like always waking up in the middle of the night, like at one or 2 a.m., I'm like just awake. And I, it's sometimes very difficult for me to settle back down. And this has just been since COVID. So I don't know why, but it's, it's now routine for me. So hmm. I'll like, I'll, I'll, I'll uselessly like look at my phone and stuff like that, which is a terrible, terrible idea. Cause of course, it stretches out, but you know, it's a bad habit. <laughs> Are you a planner or do you operate more on gut feeling? 
Uh, do you just go with the flow or do you have a strict set of steps that you're usually following? Um, I think I'm more of a gut feeling kind of a person. I think my, my uh, I definitely think that's true. Yeah, I'm a bit compulsive, a bit, yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's fair. I, I think there's certain things that I plan out um, but I, I'm for, for work related things, I think I'm a bit more of a planner, but for like home things, like let's say what we're eating for dinner, <laughs> I will, I, I, I tend to have a very, uh, a very, uh, let's say, uh, low patience on terms of like, okay, if there's something and I have an idea in my head about what I want to eat, it's going to be in the next few days or else. Yeah. So <laughs> So I'm more of a gut feeling kind of person, I think. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, do you struggle with procrastination? Yes. My God, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's a very serious problem for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, I mean, I, I this whole getting up early in the morning actually literally did come from the fact that if if I if I worked on something, let's say I had a problem set due or something like you know, in, in my undergrad, right? Then I would find that if I worked on it ahead of time, I would waste a ton of time and I would just be, you know, puttering around. And so I, I, I kind of evolved into the setup where I would wake up, you know, I would have wake up with enough time to finish something, but it was like, it would be due at like 9 a.m., right? And I'm up at like maybe four or maybe three. And I was, that that gives you a lot of clarity on what you're spending your next little while on, right? So yeah, so that's what, that that helped uh, actually deal, deal with my procrastination. But then again, that is kind of the extreme form of procrastination in the sense that it doesn't get worse than that, so yeah. I, I have to say, Aaron, I, I empathize so much with what you're saying. <laughs> Oh, that's good. <laughs> I, I relate so much to to these sort of sort of decisions. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can, yeah. I mean, the, the funny thing is, like, so Joelle is very different from me, right? So she's like very much of a planner. So there's we're a, an, an interesting study in contrast this way. And so yeah, yeah. So yeah, how, I'll be on. How, how do you, how do you uh, come to terms and what's the what's the working agreement in the conflict between plans and spontaneity? Oh well, I think I think it's pretty much as you would imagine, right? In the sense that plans usually win out, right? Like so, when we think about what what we're gonna do for the summer vacations, right? She'll have planned something, I won't have, so we'll do the thing that she planned. <laughs> kind of how it's going to work right yeah. so yeah so that we're actually i'm struggling with that right now because i want to go camping uh this summer and so just finding time to even just sit down and coordinate that like in you know it's not exactly my forte that planning those kinds of things in advance so so yeah so that's that's a that's a current struggle do, do you sometimes rely on her plans that uh, you 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 yeah. can take you can take certain risks because you know that there will be a plan. Oh, absolutely. That you'll be yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. That that yeah, yeah. And I actually I think I rely not just on on you know Joelle's plans, but I I rely on the competence of the people around me generally a little too much for that, right? Like I I kind of think things are gonna work out. You know, someone's gonna warn me about something if there's something I've missed. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I, I do that to a fault. Are you competitive, Aaron? Am I competitive? Ah, mm -hmm. uh, good question. I think, in certain respects, I am. Yeah, I, I think I think I am. Uh, not in all respects, but in certain respects, there's things I care about, and in those things, I think I am a little competitive. I don't I don't love that about my personality, but I think I, I am a little competitive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For example, for example, I, I won't, and, and and you know, this is just between you and I and who's ever listening. Uh, I, I refuse now to, to race my daughter, um, I, even at sprinting at this point, because I know she's going to beat me. <laughs> I just won't do it anymore. Because the last time we raced was like a few years ago, and, and I beat her. And so she's just itching to race, <laughs> to have, to have a, a sprint, and I, I just won't do it. Until I feel like I have a competitive advantage, which I think will be a very, very long time, if ever, at this point. Okay. 
uh, is there a rejection or a failure that hurt particularly bad? Good question. Uh, um, I'm sure the answer is yes, but I'm trying to think of, of what, I mean, I guess there's a few paper rejections that hurt, uh, but um, yeah, I'm trying to think. So I guess when I applied to uh, universities, um, for my, I mean, I got into, in my undergrad, I got into what I was, I wanted to get into, uh, which was the University of Toronto Engineering Science Program. Um, so I don't really feel like there was much disappointment there. At, for my PhD, I think I applied at, at like a few different schools and I didn't get every one of those, but I feel like on the, on the whole, I got into you know, I felt pretty lucky that I got into the ones that I got into. So I don't feel like I, that hurt particularly. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe not. I mean, there, there's, okay. Um, there, there was, okay. I guess, I guess the thing that hurt the most was, um, was there's, there's just one project that I was working on and it, it just didn't work out, um, and it, it was, and became a like a, a an issue amongst the people involved in the project as well. Like it was just the the interpersonal dynamic, and so mm -hmm. it was like a complete breakdown in communication. Mm -hmm. And it was a project I, I really cared a lot about, and so that part was probably yeah probably the most difficult thing I've kind of faced in my professional life, at least, um, mm -hmm. in terms of just dealing with that kind of failure. Yeah, so, so that one, that one, I still, still, I still feel in the sense that, that, you know, I, I, I still think about, like, my role in, in the conflict, and if they're, like, because I feel like it was, in the end, it was a completely, uh, it was just a miscommunication, right, it, and it was, but a tragic miscommunication. And I really feel that, that like, if there was a way I could have expressed myself better uh, and, and, and been more, I mean, the, I don't know though, cause I was pretty open and honest. I think I was just a little too cavalier in, 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 in my communication. And I think that that maybe was, when I think back on it now, I think that might be what, where I failed was that I, I needed to be a bit more careful mm -hmm. about how my how what I was saying was being received, not necessarily that I was saying anything that like wrong necessarily, but I was a little too cavalier in, in the kinds of the things I was saying, so that I was not completely understanding how the other person was understanding what I was saying, and so there was an opportunity for misunderstanding there, and I and I do take responsibility for that because there, especially when in, in you're in a situation when you're you know in a project and and maybe there's students involved or then, you know, and, and if I'm an advisor and there's a student involved, there's a, a real sort of power dynamic at play. And you have to be very careful how you enter into those kinds of conversations because, you know, you can say things not thinking much of it, but I remember being a student in this situation and the students thinking about this for weeks and weeks, right? Of like the, so you, you have to be a bit more careful in that. And then there's, at least one situation where I can think of that I was not as careful as I think I, I really should have been. And there were consequences from it. Yeah. Yeah. Conversely, is there an achievement or a success that felt particularly good? Um, well, let's see. I guess, I'm trying to think. I guess uh, so. I am in in my um, when I applied for PhD programs. I remember. I guess the thing that stands out for me is I remember getting into uh, Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute for the PhD program there, and I was I was at home visiting my parents uh, when I found out, and and uh, I I was very happy about it. We we actually went bowling that night, 
but it's something we almost never do. So it kind of stands out in my memory uh, of, uh, of the activity. But yeah, no, I think that was probably one of those moments where I, I, I really felt, you know, very happy with that accomplishment and kind of what that meant for the future. And, and in retrospect, I was, I was really happy to have been there. So I, I really enjoyed myself there. I love the program. So I, I you know, I, I'm even more excited for myself, you know, thinking back and than I was at that time, because I think, yeah, I think it was, it, was, it was a really important step for me in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, this is the early 2000s, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was actually 1999 or something, mm -hmm. something like that. Maybe. Yeah. I think it was that. I think it was 1999, somewhere around then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you think of yourself as a roboticist? No, no, not at all. I didn't think of myself as a roboticist then either. The only, the only robotics I touched the whole time I was there was um, I helped, well, I worked on a project with a friend um, building, uh, he, was, he, was, he was doing real robotics. He was uh, uh, working on a tractor. Uh, so it was an agricultural uh, application. So I was helping him doing some, some modeling work. And I really felt like I was doing robotics at that point. Uh, and then the only other time I, I, I was helping another friend, he was, he was doing this like um, kind of like a paintball type uh, demo with, with robots. He, was, he had these little robots shoot these like little air balls around. And so I was helping him set up. So that was my, uh, that was some total of my robot experience while I was there. I was doing other things, but, but I, uh, yeah. But I still highly recommend the Robotics Institute actually as a, as a place to, to, um, be educated yeah, i think it was fantastic yeah. yeah what is one thing that you are worse at than people around you oh god uh yeah tons of stuff i i'm uh i'm a slow reader uh i'm i'm a mess my handwriting's pretty messy <laughs> Let's see, wait, how much time you got? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it sounds like you've thought about this. Yeah, well, I just, you know, I live with these experiences. Like, I'm, I was, I mean, I, I, growing up, I was like, there was at some point where I was like, I was in a class for gifted children and a class for kids that needed extra help at the same time. <laughs> this is just kind of how it goes, right? So, so yeah, I mean, the, you you know, you learn coping mechanisms and stuff like that. And, uh, and yeah, so I was I, reading out loud is terrible. I could never be a broadcaster. Um, the also in, in terms of math, I, for some reason, I'm bad at like combinatorics, like, mm. those kinds of things just, oh, I get very confused by that. I don't know why, but oh. I, 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 maybe I missed something at some point, but yeah. Com combinatorics is like, that was one of the things I loved. It was <laughs> like, yeah, wow, yeah. I I, st I tried for some years in grad school to figure out if I could, because I, I took a bunch of like advanced combinatorics class in the classes yeah. in the math department, and for years I was trying to see if I could find any application in machine learning. <laughs> they, they were like, I couldn't succeed. It just wasn't yeah. lucky <laughs> for me, right? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm bad at that. I'm just, I, and I feel that's that one I feel like I feel on a daily basis. Whenever, whenever, <laughs> whenever it comes up, I'm like, oh, not this again. But yeah, it's, it's hopefully, or thankfully, it's not that often, but yeah. Yeah. If, if anybody mentions picking out two red balls out of a bag containing yeah, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. somebody else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty ironic that, it, yeah, no, it's tough. Yeah. What would you say is your biggest strength? Ah, okay. What is my biggest strength? Um, I guess for me, where where I think, um, I think I'm kind of determined, and I think for myself personally, um, I don't, I don't know if this is a a strength that is uh, apparent to other people. Like, I don't know if anybody who knows me would, would argue that that's a, a strength of mine, but, but I do think that that's in my research career, that's really helped me a lot. It's like, I've been chasing down kind of ideas and it takes me a while, but like during my PhD, uh, the, like, you know, I mentioned I wasn't doing much robotics. What I actually ended up working on was, was animal learning experiments. And so, like classical conditioning, right? This is what I wrote my PhD on is modeling this kind of thing. And, and what that meant was that I would be like spending hours going through these old stacks of papers. And like, you know, I was probably 
in the early 2000s, I was probably the only computer scientist that was still photocopying papers out of like 50 year old journals and things like that. But I, so I would read like all of these papers of these old experiments and, and then I sort of slowly get through to an idea of how to model them. And I love that, I, that idea of taking a big project like that and, and kind of synthesizing it slowly into something new. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of miss the, the opportunity to do that kind of thing nowadays, but because uh, it's a little too fast paced and too superficial at the moment. But yeah, yeah, I guess, I, yeah, so so that that I think is probably the thing I, I would say that I treasure about myself. That's the way I would put it, actually. That's, makes sense. Um, how do you make uh, difficult decisions? Are there certain lines of thinking or frameworks that you go to to make dis difficult decisions? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not that. That would require being a little more organized. The, I think I, I think I would probably just tend to go with the. Yeah, I think I would ultimately there. there I, I do mull things over. Sometimes I mull things over a little too long, but I guess I don't make lists. I don't, um, I mean, I think, I feel like there might be some amount of that going on when I mull things over, but mm -hmm. ultimately I just, I come to a decision and I like to have a reason why, like I'll, I'll justify it to myself, but it's probably more of a post hoc. Post -hoc yeah. Yeah. So, sounds like you're, you're a lot more model-free than model-based. Like it's yeah, like, I think that's right. <laughs> yeah. But ironically, my, my, at least my PhD research was more on the model-based model side of things. But yeah, yeah, I think I am more model-free, actually. <laughs> Although, I say that, but, but the one thing I do have a tendency to do is, like, if there's something that happens, like if, if you know, we're going about our day and something bad happens, like some... I, some dish drops or something like that right I'll, I'll be i'll be i tend to be the one who's like okay let's stop okay let, like let's think about what happened there and how can we change things so that that doesn't happen again i'm hmm. very much in policy adaptation yeah uh, but, but that, that that doesn't sound in contradiction to model free you you yes, like, there, there's an element of surprise there's a moment of pause yes. there's an opportunity to learn and so that's right that's right I, i'm focused on the policy not the model it's true <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Do you have an internal monologue? Do you talk to yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much so. Oh, yeah. And in what language? Uh, it, in, in English. Um, yeah, yeah, very much. Uh, is that what you mean? Yeah. Are, are, you bi are you bilingual? I am, but I'm very, well, I, I am, uh, but I'm, I'm like, English is my, is my, is my mother tongue. And yeah, I, I, I very much think in English. I'm, I'm much more comfortable in English than I am in French. I think, I mean, the, that's, that's one of the, so in, in Montreal, I find, like we have lots of friends where, where you know, around the table we're, we're speaking French. In fact, around our own table often we're speaking French. And with my kids, I don't really experience much of a deficit. I like prefer whatever reason I speak with my kids in French and that's, that works out fine. Although more and more, I'm speaking English with my kids actually, which it's kind of interesting. And they're they're the ones that are sort of initiating this now. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny because they're they're all francophone, and uh, that's that's their mother mother tongue. Mm -hmm. But um, but with friends, I often find that I'm kind of it, I, I'm just I feel like I'm operating at a lower IQ in French than I am in English, and I I feel that I I miss. Mm -hmm. I miss those extra IQ points sometimes. Yeah. But but it's beyond the phase where you can feel yourself translating. It's not that. Um yeah, it's I, it's not quite that, but it, I am, I mean, I make lots of mistakes in French. I mean, there's lots of things that 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 I'm yeah, that I yeah, make lots of mistakes. You know, I, I I used to when I would teach in French, I don't teach that much in French anymore because our, our classes are often mixed between McGill, which is an English, mainly English language university and University of Montreal at the grad level. But it, when I taught undergrad course, 
boxes. Uh, that would, you know, as an English Montreal, that would be in French. And, uh, you know, I, when I started, I would often like begin with a kind of an apology for, for what I'm about to, to do to your language. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I mean, the, the students are actually really good about it, right? They're, they're, they're um, you know, they're, they're there to learn and they're, they're pretty understanding. And so, yeah, I've never had any problems with that, but uh, yeah. So very much in this though, when, I, when I'm thinking my own internal monologue, yeah. And are you a visual thinker? Do you have pictures, diagrams, search yeah. trees in your head? Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's definitely a, like, a, like a language dialogue, but I do, I do tend to think visually as well. I think, I think I'm kind of slightly more visual thinker than not, right? So, so um, when I'm trying to work something out, right, either in math or, or I'm trying to build something, like physically trying to build something, I, I, I'm often trying to visualize it, yeah. And you, you have an easy time uh, translating coordinates and like rotating ma maps in your head and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I would imagine that's pretty common amongst people in our field. Oh, you'd be surprised. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I guess, I guess so. Huh. Or at least sub subject to the sampling bias of uh, <laughs> of the people chosen here, but uh, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I guess I would be surprised. That's interesting. Huh. Yeah, I think I think I, well between Joel and I, I would say I'm I'm more visual than than Joel. Mm -hmm. What do you tend to think about when you're not actively trying to think of something? What goes on in the back burner? Oh. Uh, <laughs> You mean like, okay, well, um, I, I, I have certain obsessions at, at different points in time. Um, and so, so right now and for the last little while, uh, there's, I, so it depends, right? So, so, so I do have some work obsessions and that happens to be things related to, to games right now, uh, like game theory. And so I, I, hmm. I often am thinking about that. Um, when it, that's kind of on the back burner, but but it, 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 more in terms of like just hobbies, I, I'm I'm kind of an an avid. My family would say obsessive uh, fisherman. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I enjoy fishing, and so uh, yeah, so I'm often thinking about that. And right now, in particular, because we're sort of in between seasons, I'm I'm often sort of daydreaming about the the opening of the season to, to go fishing. Yeah, and that is actually. By the way, that is where I find my serenity, like more than just like when you were saying that when it's when you work out. For me, that is the most serene thing, just being on a river or a lake and nobody around and just fishing. That, that there's something very, very zen about that for me. Interesting. Um, and but I imagine uh, that this is the sort of uh, wistful longing type thinking. There's not really a, a background thread planning your next outing, or is that? Uh, well, sometimes it's with belonging. Yeah, some most most of the time, I guess it, I would say it's that. Sometimes it's not. Like sometimes it's it's like problem solving. Huh. Like like, uh, like last fall, I was I was because um, because well, I'll just finish this. Last fall, I, I had a mission to catch a, a sturgeon. So sturgeon are these big fish, and in, in much of the world, they're actually really endangered. But it just happens that around here in the St. Lawrence, they're actually really really common. Um, so we're actually allowed to catch them, and, um, and so yeah, my I had a mission of catching a sturgeon, and so I, and I it was like not working at all. I was like like <laughs> coming up up empty all the time. So I was really starting to have to think about okay, how, my equipment, and all. So it's very much a planning thing that was going on. Yeah, but most of the time it, it's kind of wistful longing. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Imagine, imagine sharing with people that in the middle of some meeting when you're lost, like <laughs> that's what's going on. Yeah, I, I tend not to share that too much. Although you know, some people know of my my particular obsessions, but uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, I don't I don't interrupt with saying <laughs> I've got it, <laughs> Eureka. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Are you happy with the number of close friends you have? Uh, yes, yes. And I should say the number of close friends I have is, is, is quite small. <laughs> but I, but like I mentioned before that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a terribly social person, actually. And so I'm quite happy with the number of close friends I have, actually, yeah. Yeah, the, 
I don't know. I mean, I like people. I'm not. I'm not a misogynist, but I. I just. I don't so strongly feel the need for uh, like like social interaction. Yeah. Yeah. What are you insecure about? Um, I guess I, you know, I, I sometimes I'm insecure. I'm insecure about my public speaking. So I hmm. think I think I'm okay at it. I don't think I'm as good at it as I want to be. And sometimes, yeah. So that's something I actually am insecure. So somebody, you know, a professor, you you get kind of used to public speaking. So it's a little surprising, but. I feel like I feel like I I want it's something yeah this maybe is a better answer to some of your other questions too this is something I'd really love to be really good at mm -hmm. and I just I I just don't know if I could ever be as good as I want to be at it right like mm -hmm. that's and I that that bugs me sometimes that mm -hmm. that so I'm I can be in different circumstances. I can be a little bit insecure about that. Hmm. Yeah. Is, is there a particular uh, person or a particular thing that you have in mind? What what goal are you trying to reach? Because oh, so I don't think I have a. There's no one person that that I'm thinking about of like uh, that I think, wow, I really wish I could speak like that person. But there, there's like, there's certain things I just know I can't do, right? So you know how there's different styles of public speakers? Some people are really, really polished and some people just aren't. They're sort of more charismatic, but like off the cuff and that's about all they can do. Mm -hmm. That I'm more in that category, right? So if I'm charismatic, that's great, but uh, that's all I've got. I've got, I can't be polished. That's my, so. I wish I could do the uh, the whole gamut. I wish I could have both because there are some times that off the cuff just won't work, right? You mm -hmm. cannot do that, right? Like a huge conference, right? Like like say you're giving a keynote talk at some ginormous conference, right? Mm -hmm. Off the cuff is not great for that kind of a setting, right? It it can fail spectacularly, yeah. and I just that's the only gear I feel like I have. Right. I, the, the polished talk is not something I, I'm like to the extent that I've ever tried it I, it just goes horribly wrong like I really do feel like I am better as a speaker when I'm in the mode of being less polished but more in the moment um, yeah so I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I guess if I was giving advice to people I would say you know what I do is you know I figure you have to figure out what you're good at in this regard and, and just kind of make make it as good as possible and if you can exercise the other directions like like practicing those muscles that's great i've never managed to really practice those really polished talk muscles very well and to the point now where i i, I have more or less given up that that ambition yeah uh, but yeah so yeah is, 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 is the fear that uh, that this will require lifestyle changes about <laughs> No, I, well, I, I don't, I mean, I think, no, I don't think so. I don't think that that's, uh, no, I don't think there's a fear of that. I just don't think I'm capable of it, or, or at least to the extent that I've tried it, it it's, it's gone badly. <laughs> so, so yeah, I just don't, I, I tend to like, maybe, maybe like what my experience of it is that I tend, if I'm, if I'm too practiced and I, I'm like, maybe have a, something like a script, I'm like, I step outside of, of the presentation, right? I'm, I'm thinking about other things. I'm not in the moment. And I don't think it comes across as, as a terribly engaged presentation. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've become very sensitive to this issue on Zoom uh, these days. Like, like, for example, I can tell when somebody's reading a script when they're presenting on Zoom in a way that like, I, and I'm, I'm like super sensitive to it. Whereas before, it, I don't think it really would have bothered me that much to hear somebody uh, like reading something. But for some reason on Zoom, it just, I just tune right out if I hear, if I feel like somebody's reading a script. 
Oh. Well, also, yeah, I, I've, I've noticed it, but I, I, well, not about you, myself, I've noticed, <laughs> I, I can, I, I can tell, um, but also because like over Zoom, we can see people's gaze in a way that I don't think uh, we could before, like I can, yeah, the raster scan eye pattern is, is <laughs> right, right, you know. yeah, maybe that's it, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I bet. Like, it's also something in the the cadence of the speech. It just changes if you're reading something. I feel. Hmm. Yeah. I uh, yeah, but th that would be that would be audible. That's audible in polished talks as well, right? You can tell when someone's reading notes in a polished talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. I don't. But this never used. I I basically never noticed this before as something that bothered me particularly until uh -huh. we started having Zoom talks. And I, maybe it's just that like, it's a bit more like a television screen. And so you're sort of, there mm -hmm. is often more of an intimacy than when you're in a public talk, right? Because you're further back from the person. There's an understanding that this is more of a public setting. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, it's like Zoom, like it's sort of the magic of television bringing you into people's living rooms kind of thing, right? But yeah. that there's this intimacy that just gets end up getting broken by somebody reading. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, I'm speculating, but I'm, I've just noticed this. Yeah. What is something surprising about you? Something that the rest of us may not guess besides fishing at this point? <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of surprising. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm an unusual, I'm, I have unusual ha hobbies and habits. So there's a, like, um, I, I, I'm, I am fairly obsessive about wine, uh, in the sense that I have a, a wine collection. I'm, it's another hobby of mine. Um, that's not maybe as unusual, uh, about, about fishing. Um, I, right in here is my wine collection. Oh, and, wow. That's uh, a big door. Oh, it's a small wine. It's a small okay. wine. <laughs> it's a door into a closet, basically. Okay. <laughs> temperature control closet but I also happen to have a worm farm in there to for my fishing so that's that might be surprising and, and unusual um uh what else I I do play around with archery a little bit that's what this is here archery uh, yeah yeah I'm, I I I'm not like I'm not uh I am a let's say a uh like a very much a hobbyist in this regard. Like I, I'm, I just sort of putter around with it. Hmm. Yeah. Someday you, I might get more serious, but for now it's it's just a puttering around thing. And uh, I understand you own a machete. Yes. Yes. <laughs> How'd you hear about that? I actually have to. <laughs> it's oh like yeah. That. Oh well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is. I just happen to have it handy. Why? Not that Why? I around. <laughs> Okay, that is, <laughs> why, why do you have it so handy? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just, we just happen to be in my, like, this is my, my workshop. Like, I don't have an office. When we, we built our house, we didn't design it for COVID. So, mm -hmm. Joelle took, takes, uh, takes one of our son's rooms for her office uh, during the day. And I'm just literally in my workshop. So this is just stuff I have in the workshop. I've got a little the bow is just here because there's no place else for it. Yeah. So okay. yeah, I think I think those are plenty <laughs> surprising things. <laughs> and what is something about the world that surprises you? Ah, I well, so so I guess the recent political trends I found surprising. I didn't see this coming. Like I, I think I tend to be somebody who really strongly believes in in uh in freedom of speech, but I, I've come to see that, you know, that maybe there's a limit to this. Like maybe there's dangers to to uh to people saying things and that I mean that's always been the case. But that I think has, you know, recent political events has, that has taken me by a bit by surprise that to, that maybe we need to rethink these things as a society. Like I feel like I'm very much a child of of the, you know, the the this 
liberal uh, Western kind of point of view and, 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 you know, I'm kind of questioning that to a certain extent that maybe we, there, there's limits to that. And yeah, I, I, that part has been surprising to me that, that I, that I've been thinking along these lines, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Do you think that's that's a, that's a natural progression of generations? That uh, you know, there's this there's this trend that uh, young people tend to lean a lot more left, and as you grow up, you tend to become a bit more socially conservative. And I'm oh. this is... yeah, I, I don't know. Actually, I, I feel like I don't feel like I've become more. Conservative. I don't I don't view this as conservative necessarily um the I, I feel like i've always been right where i am i could be wrong about that but i i, I so i don't think so i i mean you know the i'm in a family where i am probably the most conservative person here uh but i'm used to that actually i i, I was a bit like that growing up as well so but i mean I'm not a very conservative person. I'm just around people that I would regard as fairly left wing. So, which is fine. But, but, but I, I tend to be more. I t let's say I, I tend to have more like let's say uh, libertarian tendencies, if you like. But, but not. You know, not in a. Not not in any way. Like let's say, you have to. For a Canadian living in Quebec, living in the plateau in Montreal, in Quebec, I'm a little bit on that side. But you have to, there's a context. Yeah, there's a context. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, what is something that you strongly suspect but have no proof of? Oh, good question. Um, huh. it, can it be technical or can it, does it? Uh, yeah, no, technical is fine. So I feel like, let's see, how do I even approach this? So there's, so if I'm mentioning um, game theories, right? So, so and, uh, and so right now we think about game theory as being um, in, in optimization in game theory as sort of agents chasing each other around, or at least this is the, this is the challenge to game theory. And I'm kind of, ten, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, although I don't know if I, I don't think, I think strongly suspect is, is too, is too much, too strong a term for what I feel is that I, I'm kind of wondering if there's a way to think about that, stepping outside of that kind of chasing around game and, and framing it into, in a context where you don't see it that way at all. I'm very much from this, I'm very much inspired by sort of the original GAN formulation and then the, the washer scheme GAN, where you sort of step outside this kind of game dynamic and you sort of see it as, oh, no, you've got like, you can break apart the game dynamic and you can op do this optimization, which you then regularize and then mm -hmm. give a signal to the other agent to train. And I'd love to think that there was that kind of relationship in the context of game theory. So maybe maybe it's worth saying why I care about game theory, because this is, this is more of a high level thing that I think game theory is a really really interesting problem and and but i'm not like I, I, this is not an area I'm, I'm particularly actively engaged in research but why i think it's really interesting is that and the direction of game theory that i think is really interesting are is areas where um you have a, a kind of a competitive relationship with other agents but also a, co a cooperative actually done work in this area <laughs> a cooperative relationship with other agents right I, I find that that dynamic really really interesting and and one that i think is going to become really important in the world right like we we essentially live in this all the time right where we're exactly. where we have you know our own objectives and yet we can we can uh which are not the same as everybody else's yet we can go farther in our own objectives if we learn to cooperate with others and, and how we do that is, is a really interesting problem at, at every scale, right? Like this, this is true of, 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 you know, on the international stage between governments, and this is true of individuals and, and just trying to get to work, right? In traffic, right? This is, this is true at every scale. And I'm fascinated by that dynamic. And, and, and that 
you know, in game theory, unless you're clever, the answer is usually bad news, right? You, you fall into defect effect in an iterated prisoner dilemma, right? Whereas, you know, are there strategies that allow us to robustly get out of that? And of course yeah. there are some, but, but that, that space I think is really, really interesting. Just from a, just from a human progress point of view, I think this is one of the places where maybe AI has something interesting to offer. I hope so, because the the yeah. search the search for you know positive sum games games of sufficiently long horizon in the middle of you know what seems like just a zero sum computation feels tremendous value. Like that's isn't that how we derive any sort of meaning to civilization by just like at least in locally temporally bounded regions coming up with positive sum games. Let's just cooperate because yeah. it helps everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so coming up with algorithms that step outside of that dynamic would be would be amazing. But I, but I'm most interested in cases where we're not necessarily um, like there are there are approaches, and I, mean, I think these are great. But I, I, personally, I'm not that interested in approaches that essentially change the nature of the game, right? Where where you're saying, okay, well now I'm just going to declare these two people on or these two agents as a member of a team, for example, right? That you can do that, but I. I, I'm, this is a case where I'm really interested in find, in algorithms in the context of, of, a, of a game structure where we're not changing the rules necessarily. Yeah. I hope you I hope you find something interesting. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, I hope we find things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How do you imagine your retirement? Oh, uh, that's 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 easy. I mean, I I. I I don't think I will necessarily retire. Um, I think I'll be kind of putting around in this space for as long as I can. But, but the, I mean, look, my activities are essentially that of a retired person anyway. <laughs> I'm fishing, like I'm, I'm fishing out there with like 60, 70 year olds, so I'm good, right? I, I feel like I'm, I've got that part figured out. <laughs> that, that's an interesting uh, take on things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so no, no, uh, no, uh, no significant changes of like you know moving to a certain part of uh, the country or or the world. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't feel an urge to. I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not opposed. Mm -hmm. um, I do like to travel. Uh, I think there's lots of fun things to see. But no, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with kind of where I am. I think there's, I that's one of the things I've. I've enjoyed about the, the, the pandemic is actually it is like you know forced us all to kind of explore our our local regions a little bit more mm -hmm. and uh, I've really enjoyed that actually uh, yeah so this is the, the sturgeon fishing is an example of that actually <laughs> yeah. they're all in the St. Lawrence and I'm like literally living in an island in the middle of the St. Lawrence so <laughs> yeah do you, do you think about the future much on a five to ten year horizon um, for myself, like career plan kind of thing, or or on a personal front. Uh, yeah. So, so I do. I, I mean, I, I guess, I guess one of the things that for me marks the passage of time right now more than say uh, career objectives is actually on the family side, right? So I've got my youngest are are eleven year old twins. And my oldest is is 17. And so, you know, a few years ago, it, it dawned on me that we're no longer a young family, right? This, there's a solidly middle-aged family here. <laughs> and, and, you know, we're starting to get to this point where, where I feel nostalgic about like family vacations and stuff like that, because I know that, that pretty soon, and it's, we're already seeing it, that it, more and more we're taking family vacations and our, our oldest isn't joining us anymore. And so, mm -hmm. I'm I'm sort of living through this transition to, to you know the kind of the end of the family unit, and so I'm very much aware of that in the next like five to ten years. That that's kind of uh, what I think about. So yeah, I guess I guess I do think about this. Um, yeah, I also I think I I don't know. I get the impression I think in in order to amount of time about like the future of humanity, but like way way distant future of humanity. Like like it. it it troubles me that we might not be around to survive the the the, uh, the death of our son, 
for example, which is something I don't think I should spend a lot of time worrying about, but I can't help it. It actually does trouble me. Interesting. <laughs> Like, yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't trouble me. Uh, so, but I, I can't tell if that's normal or not. That's just <laughs> but my yeah. my perspective is. Uh, it it does trouble me that uh, we may be living too early in a technological age. That like, like there's like imagine living before uh, you know cars or electricity or like you know there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff that exists right after you and you're like. Uh, but but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to sort of have this, this kind of local bias that says we're living the best possible times. Like, I, and like, I honestly do kind of feel like that. I mean, we're, you know, the, and, and especially given the kind of work we do, you know, I, I feel you know, really privileged to be, you know, with a bit of luck, we're going to see us progress to something pretty special, right? Where we're going to start having agents that are, that are going to be sort of essentially indistinguishable from a kind of human level intelligence and, and we will be treating them as humans and or or beyond humans soon right so i mean how soon i have no idea i hope to see it in my lifetime i think we're you know i do tend to hold with those that say we're much farther than some people might think i think there's a lot of hype about this like a, a few years ago that has kind of i think calmed down uh, recently yeah. I think that's a good thing um, but but I still think like I, I still expect to see this in the in the not too distant future, and so I'm I'm excited for that. Yeah, I, I think that'd be awesome. And, and so I mean, seeing that transition, uh, I mean, can you imagine a better time to be alive? I I, I don't know. It seems pretty good to me. How about right after it? Um... Well, but right after. I mean, who knows what kind of trouble we're creating here, right? Like maybe no one will have any jobs or this. <laughs> real problem i'll be you know pretty nicely safely retired and fishing and so yeah <laughs> no, no. look i think there are going to be social challenges into the future and I, I think you know hopefully we're going to be creating a much better world but but seeing just being a part of this this generation and this you know well maybe multiple generations that are creating that go, going through this transition i think it's been really exciting um, but then again, I mean, there, like, there are, I think there are change points in history, right? Times are, are genuinely different than other times. And as far as I can tell, we're kind of living one, right? And it started like, you know, with the internet and the connectivity and it's kind of going through, through to AI. Like, I mean, once we zoom out, like in 200 years from now, like how are people are going to view this time? I think. I don't know, but but it looks like it, it'd be all kind of this this pretty significant switch from more of an industrial economy to more of an information economy, and with all of that the, the, that entails, I think it's kind of exciting to, to be around for that kind of transition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um... On to a shorter time horizon. Sure. What's your what's your concrete prediction for when the world will open back up after COVID? Oh, yeah. I, so uh, I don't. I, uh, I hate real predictions where where I can prove to be wrong. Or not. <laughs> um, so I guess I, <laughs> falsifiability, man. You're a scientist. I know. I know. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, so I guess I, I well. I mean, if you look at things, you know, there it, it will depend on what what we mean by open up. I, I think conferences, it's still going to be another roughly year before we see, see live conferences, and even then, probably going to a bit of a hybrid model. I have strong suspicions that that's not going to work great. I mean, I, I think the yeah. So so just to get the time set out of the way, I, so yeah. So I think. I think a year from now we're going to start going back to something that looks a bit like normal, but I don't think we're going back to normal. Mm -hmm. I think we've changed. Uh, like, you know, I I don't feel like I'm going back to normal <laughs> in the sense that I think I am going to probably end up working more at home than I than I w did before, and I think a lot of people are going to do that. I, I think that that's um, so. Whatever we move to, like I think. Borders are going to open up. 
uh, my strong suspicion is that, like, for example, like uh, the border between Canada and the U.S., maybe later this summer, I think, would open up. So uh, travel, tourism travel will probably be, oof, it will depend, right? Like, it, it'll just depend entirely upon our, you know, is country A and country B sufficiently vaccinated that you have herd immunity, then travel between them will be allowed. So that's, you know, between now and a year from now, I think is kind of when, in cascades will be when that happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, there was a point that you were making that I, that I agree with that um, hybrid mode is, is much harder than either fully remote or fully yeah. present. Um, and yeah. for the same reason, I think a lot of people will want to continue working from home, but I wonder how effective their meetings or their interactions with their colleagues will be if half of their colleagues are in person and the other yeah. half are distributed remotely. And I yeah, yeah, but so it's interesting, right? Because before COVID, many of my meetings were like that, actually. I would, we would often have somebody remote and mm -hmm. then the rest of us around a table. Mm -hmm. it, that, that wasn't great. Like yeah. that, that was okay, but that wasn't great. And so those meetings are actually kind of going better now that everybody's mm -hmm. on their screen. So I like, I'm kind of thinking maybe what I will do is, is arrange a setup where I take some meetings on Zoom at home mm -hmm. uh, when, when, those, when those meetings have somebody virtual anyway, so that we're just all gonna be virtual for those meetings. And then when we, everybody can get, get around a table Let's go around the table because I do think that's better. Yeah, right? the the slight hiccups in in transmission are always a little bit annoying. Um, but yeah, so and so I agree. And 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 when we talk about the conference models that have this hybrid, I totally agree with you. I think it is not it is going to be much harder than either mode, uh, either completely virtual or completely in person. And I have no idea if if we're ready for that right like just think about the bandwidth that would be required right because every poster say for example has to live stream out at the same time from a fixed venue we're not doing that right now so yeah. that on the other hand if we manage to make that work the opportunities that that opens up and makes makes these conferences available to everyone that's been one of the big advantages of of this pandemic Online. is that yeah, like NeurIPS, instead of being hundreds of dollars, is like, what, $50 or something? Yeah, something like $25. And, and, uh, and it's much, much more affordable. And there's no cost to get there. That's great. I, I would love it if we could keep that. I think there's work to be done to figure out how that would work. But I don't know. I, I think there's a commitment to attempt this. We'll see. We'll see if it works, is I think the, the way. Well, yeah. Do you think there's a point to life and our existence? Uh, <laughs> um, no, no, I don't. I, I, I think, I mean, like, I, I don't think there is some external point to any per particular person's life. I don't think there's an external point to our collective existence. I think we exist because we happen to. The universe exists because it happens to. Uh, I think I think we can make meaning of it for ourselves. Um, I don't think life is meaningless uh, at all. I think it's a it's a great gift, and and I think you know you should savor it while while you can. But yeah, I I, I don't I don't see external meaning for life. Yeah. Where where do you find meaning? I, well, ironically, I, I, I think I find meaning in, in, in my relationships. I think I find meaning in, in, uh, in family. I think I find meaning in, in work. I think, I think um, that, that when you... ...exist forever. Oh. No, no, it's fine. I can hear you. You, you 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 create anything right you create a, a blog or or, or or a paper or any anything a piece of software anything you want a piece of art right this is an an artifact that exists forever and i think there's there is meaning in that i think whoever else uses that artifact is, is there's meaning in that in that transfer there and and in relationships with people right i mean i 
I still treasure my childhood experiences with my grandfather who, who died when I was quite young. It's a pretty common thing, but, but there's, when I think about meaning in his life, I think of the, uh, his impact that he had on me and the, the values he transmitted in me. I think there's, there's a tremendous amount of meaning in that. Yeah. Just, it's not external, right? It's, 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 it's our own um, story that we tell ourselves and, and, you know, radiate to other people. And, and that's okay, right? That, does that, does that bother you? Not, no, not, not at all. Um, yeah, no, I, I find that that's, yeah, not, not at all, actually. Um, yeah, that, I, I, I'm actually, I'm not even sure why it would bother me. Like, I don't, I don't understand why, like that, yeah, I just don't feel that kind of angst. I mean, I also, I mean, I, I don't feel angst about free will not existing. <laughs> I just, I'm okay with that. It's, that's, that's, that is what it is, right? So, like, yeah, we can, we can go, we can have a conversation, another conversation about that. <laughs> Sorry to sneak that in at the last minute there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a heavy one you just dropped yeah. in there. <laughs> Okay, uh, on to perhaps more philosophical things. Um, pineapple topping on pizza. Yummy. Ah, that is, pineapple. that is a, yes, that is a, uh, an emotional conversation in my family. I, my, my kids are big fans. Um, I used to be very much against it, but actually at the, the Robotics Institute in Pittsburgh, uh, they had these pizza, uh, lunches, I guess it was, I forget what day it was, but it was one day a week, we'd have this machine learning lunch, and it yeah. was, and then and lunch. Yeah. I, I remember yeah. lunch, yeah, 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 and they would, they had, the, 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 I, I got to love the, the, the ham and pineapple pizza that they had there, and I don't know why, but that's the one I always took, so I, I learned to appreciate it there, but for the most part, I'm, I'm mostly against it, I would say, at this point, I, I figure I have better options than that, Yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, how do you capture and keep track of ideas? Oh, that's, that is a good question. I will sometimes, that is one of the things that I will occasionally write down because I find I sometimes will have ideas out there and then I will lose them. And I will sometimes wander around thinking I had an idea about that and not remember what it was. And I find that deeply frustrating. So that is the one thing will I, that I will tend to write down. I don't typically make lists, but quick little jot down of an idea that I have in the middle of the night or something like that. Yeah, that I will do. Hmm. What are some traits common to some of the best uh, collaborators or colleagues that you've worked with? Ah, uh, that's a I don't, I guess, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I see it as a trade in common. I, I, what I find is that I, I will get to a certain point, often with students. I love working with students. Um, that's one of the reasons why I, I love my job is because it allows me to work with students. And the, the things, things I like about students, okay, so this is what trade in common that, that I love working with students is, is that they are sometimes super naive about what works and what doesn't work. And that allows, that's like a superpower because that allows them to try things that somebody who knows better would never ever try. And sometimes it works and that is amazing. Uh, and so I love that. I love that naivety. So yeah, uh, that's, that I think is, is fantastic. Um, I also just tend to start to you know, different things about people, right? So like some students are, are really philosophical about ideas. Some of them are just much more like, just try a million different things, see what sticks. And uh, yeah, the, I guess, other than that one thing about being naive, I'm not sure I have, I see much kind of commonality. You get to a point where when you work with somebody for a while and uh, you sort of, get to appreciate almost the things that make them unique, right? The, the things that make them uh, sort of different than the other, other collaborators you have. So I tend to like to savor those kinds of things. They're, they're unique contributions. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
what is some of the best advice that you've gotten given or would like to give to you know students or maybe even your own kids someday yeah ah good question um i guess well it's pretty pretty open um well i i i, I mean I, I think you have to follow like in terms of choosing a career path you kind of have to follow what you, what excites you right because you, you you know you this is life is surprisingly short and it's you know there's not it's not to say that in any job there's going to be things you dislike about it but you should, you really can't waste time doing something that you're not really that you can't find things that you really savor that you really appreciate um so that would be my advice is is to is to you know find the thing that you really enjoy doing um and it's also helpful if you're good at it because <laughs> it's going to make your life easier <laughs> the the uh yeah the, 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 there was this guy that uh that um uh was uh I used to work at, at, at Parks Canada. It's just this, uh, like, essentially an admin type job. This is when I was in high school. And there's this old guy that worked there. And uh, his, his, the only thing I remember him ever saying to me, and he said it often, every time he'd see me, he'd say, he'd lean in, he'd say, Mary Rich. And then we'd walk <laughs> that, was, that was really the most, probably the most consistent advice I've ever been given. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> so so uh there we go <laughs> okay yeah um and i guess my my final question uh why did you agree to do this interview with me uh, yeah good question so <laughs> so as you know i i i i uh i didn't reply for a while because i was actually hemming and hawing about whether I wanted to do this, mulling it over, if you will. Um, but I decided that, because I knew that this was more of a, the way I looked at it was this is more of a kind of a process question, right? So I know you had people, I know you, you talked to, or I guess um, Debbie talked to uh, Joel and, uh, and Hugo was on, and, mm -hmm. and both of these are, are, are more let's say a type personalities driven organized people right and i was like i don't know if i really fit into that group i don't know and then it occurred to me that that's exactly why i probably should do this is just to show people that you can kind of do okay in this field with you know having different say habits and and just uh yeah so yeah. that's 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 why i decided to do it it's because um, i thought to the extent yeah. it's helpful to anybody, there we go. So A, I'm super glad you, you, you agreed. And B, remember that uh, I am not baby. I don't fit into that cluster either. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> I relate much more to you than, <laughs> than to you going. Yeah, well, that's good. That's cool. Yeah, I learned something. I didn't actually know that much. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Huh. Well, I'm excited. Um, so those were all my questions. Is there any aspect of your life that you think we should talk about that we didn't get to? Oh, I don't know. I mean, we talked about the Parks Canada guy. That's uh, that's a deep cut. I don't know if there's anything <laughs> left. <laughs> uh, let's see. I, I don't think so. I feel like there's pretty decent coverage. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I, I'm spent. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you again for doing this. I think oh, I, I had a lot of fun. I'm sure this yeah. is this was valuable to others as well. Oh, that's great. I thank you very much. I, I actually really enjoyed it. It was good. I don't regret it all doing it. <laughs> Happy to hear that. <laughs> all right. Bye bye. Bye.